and tonight we want to talk about the reliability and authenticity of the Bible. I've entitled this evening's message, I Camp. It's kind of a throwback from the internet terms. They're kind of getting outdated, but I put three eyes before the camp because I have three eyes in my outline as we talk about the reliability of the Scripture. We're going to be talking about inerrancy, inspiration, and infallibility of the Bible. Then we're going to talk about canonicity, archaeology, the manuscript evidence of the Bible, and prophecy. And all of those things go together, and it's going to give you a solid ground to stand on. The word campus in Latin actually means a level, solid ground. As a matter of fact, when the uh, Roman armies would come in, they would level out the ground and they would camp on it. They would set up a campus to which to wage war. It was a flat piece of land where you could set up and wage your warfare from that camp. And so that word comes to us by simply meaning a level ground. And so if we're going to camp out on God's Word, we're going to have a level ground from which to stand upon in order to defend the faith. This series is about defending the faith. And so as we stand on God's Word and we have that level ground, it's going to be the place where we can stand strong and give an answer for those who ask. But yet the Scripture says with meekness and gentleness. What is inspiration? Well, inspiration is simply the fact that the Bible is God-breathed. It is inscripturated. Inspiration means God-breathed, inscripturated words. And that's going to be important as we go on. Inerrancy means that the words are without error. The words are without error. Infallibility means, I'm just running through the outline real quick, and we'll go through it slowly in just a moment. Inerrancy means the words are without error. Infallibility simply means that the words cannot error. The words cannot error. Canon means that we have the right words contained in the 66 books of our Bible. Today, there's an attack on the church and upon Christianity where people say we don't have the words. You can't trust the Bible because it's been passed down all of these centuries, and it's copies of copies of copies, and we just don't know, and we can't have faith that the Bible is indeed the Word of God. I want to show you tonight that we do have the words, and we can stand strong in the fact that the Bible is contains all of the words that God wants us to know and all of the words that he inspired through his apostles and prophets. Then we'll look at archaeology, which simply means that the words have been confirmed through archaeology. The manuscripts, the words have been transmitted to us accurately, and prophecy, the words have predicted future events accurately. So do you get a a theme that's going on with my outline here? It's about the words. The Bible is a collection of in scripturated, which means written, God-breathed words. The doctrine of inspiration, along with its two corollaries, which is infallibility and inerrancy, make the Bible a book unlike any other book that's ever been written. The Bible is the only book God ever wrote. The Bible is the only book God ever wrote, and therefore it has infinite value for the world and for the Christian. There are two major passages of Scripture that tell us the true nature of the Bible. The first one is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. The Scripture says, All Scripture is theopneustos, which is breathed out by God, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All Scripture is theopneustos, God breathed. The second Scripture is this, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. No prophecy has ever been produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Men spoke from God as they were carried along or bore by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at these two verses very quickly in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, as I said before, this word God breathed is there in our text. I'm using the English Standard Version tonight. If you have the NIV, it's simply going to say the inspiration. The NIV, the King James, the New Living Translation, all translate that word as inspiration of God. They translate that word theopneustos. 
When you look up that word in the Greek, it actually comes from two distinct Greek words, theos and panevstos, which is God and spirit, wind or breath. The English word inspired really doesn't capture the idea of the Greek word. It should rather be translated, all scripture is expirated by God, breathed out by God is the absolute literal translation. The English corollary to that would be expirated, not inspirated, which means to breathe in, but expirated. Get the picture here. All of the words of the Bible are expirated by God expirated by God. The Bible is literally the result of the creative power or breath of God. The breath of God is that irresistible outflow of his power. The breath of God is that creative force that brought the universe into existence. Psalm 33, 6 tells us that by the breath of God, the heavens were created. The scripture tells us that by the very breath of God, the scripture was given, by the very breath of God, the hundred billion trillion stars in the known universe were created just like that. Talk about power. It's the irresistible outflow of the power of God. And Jesus told us that the, the Bible is indeed that which proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is simply the word graphi writings. It's the writings that are inspired. It's the writings that are prophetic. It's the writings that have their source and origin in God. 2 Peter 3.16 tells us that all scripture, graphi, is from God. So the locus of inspiration is in the written record. The locus of inspiration is in the written record. It's the written record. It's the Bible. It's the words. That's why when we gave the outline, it's the words that were God-breathed. It's the words that are inspired. It's the words that are inerrant. It's the words that are infallible. It's the words that are in the canon of Scripture. It's the words that have been confirmed by archaeology. It's the words that have been passed down to us through the manuscript evidence. It's the words that predict future events with 100% accuracy. It's the very words of God. The very words of God. That means that it's not only just the words and not necessarily the thoughts of the author, but it also has to do with the very letters. Matthew 5.18 tells us that it's, it's the jot and the tittle. It's the very letters of those words that are inspired by God. Not only that, it's the very grammatical form of those words, whether or not it's a verb or a noun or an adjective or an adverb. Or a conjunction, just remember a schoolhouse rock. Every time I say the word conjunction, I want to jump out and say, conjuncts and junks and help me out. What's your function? And we know it's her hooking up words and phrases and clauses. God inspired even the conjunctions, the adjectives. He inspired it all. So there is little wiggle room in the doctrine of inspiration Because inspiration extends to everything that the Bible teaches and touches upon. It's the exact letters. It's the grammatical forms of each word. And that's why the Lord told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 26.2, He said, tell the people everything I command you and do not omit a single word. Do not omit a single word. We're not given the modus operandi of inspiration which means the exact how everything took place, but we're simply given two principles in our passages of Scripture that tell us that biblical inspiration was won positively by the breath of God, and the Scripture is prophetic. Negatively, we're told that the Scripture is not from the creative imagination of the mind of men. That's what people want to say today. They want to say that the Bible is simply a result of the creative imagination of men. It's not inspired. It's not from God. It's no different from any other book, let alone any other holy book. But yet, we are told in the Scripture that God inspired the very words. The Bible is prophetic. The Bible is God-breathed. The Bible is not from the creative imagination of men. The Bible is prophetic. Because its source and its content is supernatural. Its source and its content is supernatural. 
B.B. Warfield said this about 100 years ago. He said, the Bible is the word of God in such a sense that its words, though written by men, were written nevertheless under such an influence of the Holy Ghost that is to be that God gave the very words of Scripture. He goes on to say, it is the adequate expression of his mind and will. The conception of co-authorship implies that the Spirit's superintendence extends to the very choice of the words that God gave those human authors. That is verbal inspiration. It's the very words. It is verbal and it is full. We talk about the full plenary or the plenary verbal inspiration, the full inspiration of Scripture. And it preserves its product from everything inconsistent, B.B. Warfield goes on and says, with a divine authorship, so human and divine authorship, thus securing, among other things, the entire truthfulness which is everywhere presupposed in and exerted for the Scripture by the biblical writers, which is inerrancy. The Lord through Peter explains that men spoke from God as they were carried along. This is a very important word. As they were carried along by the Holy, Holy Spirit. This word is pharaomeni. It is of the root pharaoh. And it means to carry, to bear, to guide, to produce, or to drive along. It was used of a ship being driven by the wind in Acts 27, 17. The verb pharaoh in 2 Peter is in what we call a present passive participial form. Now, what does that mean? Present tense, continuous action. Passive simply means that the subject is the recipient of the action of the verb, which is to say that the prophets were being carried passively by the Spirit as they spoke, which is in an active uh, form, as they spoke actively, God breathed words. Those men were like gloves in the hand of the Holy Spirit as God told them which words to write down through their very personalities and their idiosyncrasies. It wasn't dictated in that sense, but God used the experiences. As we learned this morning, as Pastor Scott said, God is sovereign and he gets his will done. God sovereignly moved upon these writers and they were passive in this whole operation, but they were active in actually writing out those words. And so the Bible is God-breathed. It is by the will of the Holy Spirit, not the prophet's will, that men spoke from God. It was the Holy Spirit's power and purpose that, quote, men spoke from God. And we read, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men. Now this word, again, is the very same word that means carried along, but it's translated in this clause as produced. And so we have a very interesting play on words there. What the scripture tells us is that it wasn't a carry along, carrying along of the will of man, but it was the carrying along of the will of the Spirit that, bought, that brought scripture to pass. I'm going to get a little technical here for a moment. This word produced here is an aorist passive, and so it means that it wasn't by the action of, of the writers and the men that spoke from God that produced this scripture. But, that's an important word a lot of times in scripture. But, that word there is what we call an adversative conjunction. And it means but, instead, or on the contrary. So it reads like this. For prophecy was never produced by the will of man, but, on the contrary, instead of the will of man, it's been produced by the will of man of God as these men were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That is an, uh, an emphasizing of the contrasting possible sources for Scripture. Because we know that men did write, but God doesn't want you to be confused. Just because men wrote does not mean that it was by their will that Scripture came about. It is a supernatural book. Men were the very instruments and their wills, as it were, were passively conjoined to the Spirit's will to produce what was written. The prophets were passive agents while the Spirit was the acting agent that brought about Scripture. The prophets were the glove in the hand of God. 
The imagery of a ship is a not, bad, a not too bad of a, uh, a picture either. As Paul talks about the fact that they were in the ship and the wind filled up the sails of that ship and they were carried along by the power of the waves. And so we would say that essentially the Bible has come to us because what was carried was taken up by the carrier and it was the carrier's power and goal that were accomplished. The ones that were carried, the prophets, were taken up by the carrier, the Holy Spirit, and it was the carrier's, the Holy Spirit's power and goal that were accomplished. Therefore, inspiration is the process by which spirit-carried writers recorded God-breathed writings. Inspiration is the process by which spirit-carried writers recorded God-breathed writings. It was Athenagoras, I love those, those old names, one of the early church fathers that wrote, that the apostles and the prophets were like stringed instruments which the Holy Ghost put in motion in order to draw out the divine harmonies of life. Don't you like that? I like that. The prophets and apostles were stringed instruments that the Holy Spirit put in motion in order to draw out the harmonies of life. Now we want to look and we want to couple inspiration with inerrancy and infallibility. Inspiration with inerrancy and infallibility. When we talk about inspiration and infallibility, we are talking about nothing less than the authority of Jesus Christ as it has to do with the Bible. And we see that there is a great attack against the church today and a great attack against Christianity because all you have to do is turn on the Discovery Channel. All you have to do is turn on National Geographic and you can see a program that talks about these Gnostic Gospels, Thomas, Judas, and they will say, well, they were just supposed to be part of the canon of Scripture, and there was this great uh, conspiracy that took place, and et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada, yada. And I want to address some of that this evening as we talk about the absolute necessity to believe that the Bible is inspired by God, but also the Bible cannot error, and the Bible does not error. The Bible cannot error, and the Bible does not error. The words do not error, and the words cannot error. They cannot. It's infallible. Jesus said it's law. So the doctrine of inspiration is not a single pillar doctrine. Biblical inspiration is actually a three-legged platform upon which all other doctrine stands. The three legs of this platform are inspiration inerrancy and infallibility. True biblical inspiration involves the idea of inerrancy and infallibility. It is a three-stranded cord that is unbreakable in itself, but once one strand is cut loose, the rope will begin to unravel. Dr. James N. Gray confirms the fact that inerrancy and infallibility are implied in inspiration when he said this. He said, Moses, David, Paul, John... We're not always and everywhere inspired. It's, remember, it's the writings that were inspired, not the writers. Because if the writers were inspired, this is what Dr. Gray says. He says, then always and everywhere they would have been infallible and inerrant men. So it's the writings that are inspired by God. But yet today we see the unraveling of biblical authority and inerrancy. We see this in our day. Turn on the television. See these programs. Listen to churches today. Inerrancy is denied. Infallibility is denied. Go to the seminaries today. Inerrancy and infallibility are denied today. It's a sad thing to see the unraveling of biblical authority right before our eyes. And it started in the beginning of the 20th century, and now it's in full force. Dr. Wolfhart Pannenberg said this, the dissolution of the traditional doctrine of Scripture constitutes a crisis at the very foundation of modern Protestant theology. Starting with a guy by the name of Karl Barth and what is called neo-orthodoxy or the neo-evangelicalism, the text of the Bible was no longer regarded as the very words of God. 
And so we see the cord of inerrancy was severed. What is called modern existential theology has rejected the Bible as a revelation of God. And so now the Bible is only a witness to the life-giving message of Jesus Christ. In Barth's thought, the Bible is not the objectively true, inerrant, and infallible revelation of God, but it only becomes, listen to this, it only becomes a witness to the life-giving message of Jesus Christ when you place subjectively your faith in Jesus. You hear how this postmodernism is in there, this modern existentialism, postmodernism? Your kids are absolutely bombarded with this in school. It comes out like this. It doesn't matter what you believe. It comes out like this. There's no, thing, no such thing as right and wrong. Everybody believes what they want to believe, and what's true for them is true for them, and what's true for me is true for me. And Jesus, it doesn't matter if Jesus existed. It doesn't matter if Jesus rose from the grave. It's whatever Jesus can do for me right now, existentially, in the moment. And so the Bible's not the Word of God, but it'll play a witness to the Word of God when you have faith in Jesus Christ. You see how slippery that is? How dangerous that is? And that's what's behind the idea that the Bible has errors in it. That's what's behind it. Men who once held the line of inerrancy are now capitulating to the pressures of so-called modern scholarship. It's out of vogue today to speak about an inerrant, infallible Bible. There's a tact today, unlike ever before, as once conservative scholars break the leg of inerrancy and they teeter on the unstable position of a Bible that can err. The position comes what is called an inerrancy of purpose or intent rather than an inerrancy of fact. It becomes no longer an infallibility and an inerrancy. In fact, right now they say, well, it's an inerrancy intent of intent or a purpose. The Bible's only a spiritual book, so therefore it can err in science and it can err in geography and it can err in cosmology. It can err in all of these things. But when it talks about spiritual things, that's when it's inerrant. And so really when you read the scripture, you don't know what is inerrant and what's infallible or what could be a mistake or what is the very words of God because they don't see a one-to-one -one correlation between the words of God and the Bible anymore. That has permeated our educational system. That has permeated our Bible college and our seminaries. It has permeated higher scholarship. Nobody holds anymore to the fact that this Bible is the inerrant, infallible Word of God, something by which I can stake my life on. We're turning away. And that's what's happening to our culture. That's what's happening to our church. We no longer have an authority, and we do what we want. We do what we want. We live the kind of immoral lives that we want to because no longer we no longer have a Bible that's authoritative and speaks to us with the very voice of God, the vox Dei and the verbum Dei. It is the words of God. It is the voice of God in your life as a believer. They talk about the fact that the Bible is only inerrant where it counts, <laughs> where it counts on issues of faith. Barth compared the Bible. You remember records? You young people aren't going to remember records. I remember eight tracks. I remember having an eight track of Creedence, Creedence Clearwater Revival. Put that in the stereo at home and just loved CCR. Grew up on them. Had a number of, of uh, eight tracks. And then we moved to CDs, or then we moved to cassettes, and then we moved to CDs, and now we're on MP3s. But Carl Barth, he talked about the fact that the Bible is a scratched record which you can hear the master's voice in spite of all the imperfections of that record. You know, it, it always never failed that I had a record and, and whether it was uh, Creedence or uh, Van Halen or whatever, I'd put that thing on the turntable, play it, and the next time I'd come back, somebody would put a scratch in it. And then you'd start hearing all this crackling and popping. You could still hear the music, but there was all this crackling and popping that would come out underneath or even on top of the music. 
And that's what people say about the Bible today. Well, it's the master's voice. It's God's voice. But there's all these errors on top of it. And so today, what is called these limited inerrantists, they claim that modern scholarship has actually shown that the Bible's been severely scratched and damaged. And for them, this really shines through in matters of textual criticism and the error-ridden transmission of the biblical text. With much regret and sadness, I've discovered that modern biblical scholarship has become an elegant dance of unbelief. I'm a part of it. I'm a president of a seminary. I just see it all around the nation. And it's so subtle. It comes now to, well, uh, Matthew actually had to depend on Mark to write his gospel, and so uh, they, they depended on this document called Q, and nobody knows what this Q is. There's, there's no evidence for this Q, not the James Bond Q, or I, th- I think, uh, or Quincy Jones. <laughs> but they, look, they, they, they come up with all of these speculations anymore, and they try to somehow give a human reason for why the, the synoptic Gospels, which means the three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, why are they so similar? Well, duh. All three of them were eyewitnesses to the life and ministry of Jesus. And what we have with all four Gospels are four independent eyewitness testimonies of the life of Jesus Christ. Of course they're going to be similar, but there's about a 40% difference between the Gospels. I was interviewed by the newspaper here a few years ago in response to the Jesus Seminar. And you know the Jesus Seminar, they, they, uh, uh, they vote on what they think Jesus actually said in the Gospels and they use it by using their magical colored uh, marbles. Uh, not joking. But anyway, they cast, that's how they cast their vote. And I said, listen, the, 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 the Gospels, the reason why they're not all... Uh, exact duplicates of one another is because they're independent eyewitness testimony of these evangelists. And if they were all saying the exact same thing, we would think coercion. There's 40% difference between all the Gospels, which tells us that it's legitimate eyewitness testimony. Because if any of us were to give our testimony of what I talked about tonight, there would be a 40% variation in each one of your stories because you would tell it from your perspective. And yet we hear today, well, the Gospels contradict one another, and the big one is, well, John says there were two angels, and Mark says there was one angel. It's just such a bunch of nonsense. The pettiness that goes on today in scholarship. One such conservative scholar turned limited inherit, inerrantist is a guy by the name of Clark Pinnock. And let me tell you his story. He was once a very strong Southern Baptist, and he wrote two key books on inerrancy and infallibility in 1967 and 1971. But it was through the influence of an existential theologian, Karl Barth, that Dr. Pinnock changed his view and later said, quote, Barth was right to speak about the distance between the Word of God and the text of the Bible. What? Barth was right to speak about the distance between the Word of God and the text of the Bible. Do you see that separation? The Bible now just becomes a witness when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, and it's not the very words of God anymore. It's just a witness. The words of God aren't contained in the Bible anymore. It's just a witness. Dr. Pinnock says this. He says, the Bible will seem reliable enough in terms of its saving purpose. In the end, this is what matters most to evangelical believers. Not the need for a rationalistic ideal of a perfect book. He's talking about the Bible. We don't need the idea that this book is perfect and infallible anymore. This is what we need, he says. What we need is that the trustworthiness of the Bible is true where it counts. Where it counts. Truth, listen to what he says. Truth that is not so easily threatened by scholarly problems. Today, with limited inerrancy, we hear things like this. Well, the Bible's full of myths and legends. Adam and Eve were not real people. 
the Genesis account was not really the result of a creation testimony by God himself, but the Genesis account was simply the result of a Jewish adaptation of an ancient Near Eastern creation myth that is the universe as God's cosmic temple. What? That's what they say today. Genesis doesn't talk about the ex nihil creation. It's about God's cosmic temple. And so therefore they try to squeeze and get around the Bible and science. The Bible and science do not contradict one another. The Bible and science go together. Facts need to be interpreted properly. As we go on, we could talk about doctrines that have been affected by the belief of a Bible that errs. But ultimately, we have to say with the psalmist, my eyes shed streams of tears because men do not keep your law. That's where we've come to, an absolute denial of the Bible. We want to look now. We've seen inspiration. We've seen inerrancy and infallibility. Now we want to look at canon. Canon. We have the right words. We have the right words. The concept of the canon of Scripture comes from the idea of an authoritative list of books which comprise a collection called the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible is not just one book, but it's a collection of 66 books penned by 40 different spirit-carried writers over the span of 1,600 years. This word canon means a standard, a norm, a rule, or a list. And so the idea of canon simply means something to be measured up, something to be measured to. So the idea of canon presupposes that you have inspired Scripture, and so it delimits its scope. A canon limits what can be considered Scripture. Those books that upon examination have shown forth as inspired by God, they were collected as set apart and authoritative for the church. And those books that failed the litmus test, even though they were good books, weren't considered inspired, and so they weren't considered to be a part of the canon of Scripture. I have my first book coming out here in a couple months, and hopefully my book is a good book, but it's not to be included with the canon of Scripture. There have been numerous books that have been written from the time of the apostles. Even the apostle Paul warned about the fact that there are letters going around, even in the first century church, but he said, don't be alarmed. And so the Early church knew of a lot of these other Gospels. The Gospel of Judas was not just discovered. The church knows, has known about it for some 1,800 years. And so those books that didn't stand up to the test, they were never considered inspired by God. So there isn't some conspiracy, as we'll see in just a moment, what the media is trying to perpetrate today. Today, the popular media is preoccupied with this notion of conspiracy and intrigue as it pertains to early Christianity and the canon of Scripture. Popular books, movies, TV, documentaries flood the avenues of communication with speculations that raise questions as to the legitimacy of the Bible and Christianity. A guy by the name of Dan Brown authored a book called The Da Vinci Code. And with his pseudo-historical novels, he's caused people to believe that somehow the Emperor Constantine was the one who had the deciding influence of the Bibles that would be included in the canon. There's a movement today within the popular media to raise serious questions about the reliability of the Bible. Recently, there's been numerous TV shows that have been produced to highlight the discovery of the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas as they suggest that these Gospels were true expressions of the Christian faith or at least some sort of uh, equal expression of Christianity. And so the underlying accusation goes like this today. It was through the political pressures and other concurrent factors that these alternative Christianities, that Gnostic Christianity. They were subdued, they were destroyed, and so as a result, the church stomped out these Gnostic Christianities, and then they covered it all up. And so thank God for modern scholarship that has come around today 
and has actually uncovered these gospels and, and letting us know the truth. Bart Ehrman is one of those guys out there today. He's a, a best-selling author, and all of his books call into question Christianity and the Bible. He says this. He says that Roman Catholic Church eradicated all expressions of Christianity. That is Gnosticism, as found in the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas. He says they did this by choosing the books that were to be included in the Bible, and then they rewrote history. Bart Ehrman, he's a textual critic. The majority of his works are in textual criticism. And he wrote a book like this. See if you can get any clue to his uh, presuppositions and assumptions by the title of this book. Bart Ehrman, Misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible and why. He calls in the question, the Bible. He calls in the question, everything that has to do with the manuscript evidence and with the canon of Scripture. This is what he says. He says, what good is it to say that, that, the, that we have the autographs or the originals? What, is, what good is it to say that we don't have the autographs or the originals and then say they're inspired? He said, we don't have the originals of the biblical manuscripts. We have only error-ridden copies. Listen to what he said, error-ridden copies. And the vast majority of these are centuries removed from the originals and different from them, evidently in thousands of of ways. Mistakes multiply and get repeated. Sometimes it gets corrected and sometimes they get compounded. He says, and as it goes for centuries in some places, we simply cannot be sure that we have reconstructed the text accurately. Listen to the, how he pokes at people's faith. You can't trust the Bible. It, it's been full of errors. The copyists have made errors. They've compounded the errors and therefore we can't trust it. And he simply says, it's a bit hard to know what the words of the Bible mean if we don't know what the words are. He also writes, he says, copyists from the early Christian, or copyists of the early Christian liter literature occasionally change their texts to make them say what they already meant to say. How does he know that? He's just assuming that this is what happened. And so what about the canon, and what about the manuscripts, as we'll talk about here in just a few, few moments? I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to go very quickly. When it comes to the canon of Scripture, Paul told the early church, he said, when this letter has been read among you, have it also read to the churches, specifically here in Colossians. He said, have it read to the churches in Laodicea, and see that you also read my letter from Laodicea. He also mentions to Timothy, he says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of those letters that he has passed around to exhortation and to teaching. And so Dr. Geisler responds uh, and, and talks about the fact that the early church, they had Paul's letters, they were passing them around, they were collecting them, and this implies that the canon of Scripture started off with the apostles and with the eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ, and it wasn't 400 or 500 years later that the canon of Scripture was put together, but it actually started off from day one. He says this clearly indicates that the apostolic letters were intended to have a broader application than merely one local congregation. He says there, they were binding on all the church, and then as the churches were receiving and reading those authoritative writings, they were thereby laying the foundation of a growing collection of received canonical writings. And that's why our Lord told John in Revelation, he said, Blessed are those who read aloud. So the scripture was the only one that could be, the only book that could be read aloud in the church. And even Peter writes, well, actually, let me finish what Jesus told John. He tells them, Blessed are those who hear and read aloud the books of this prophecy. And then he tells John in Revelation 1.11, he says, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches of Asia Minor there. Now what that implies is that John's going to write the letter and he's going to copy it before he even sends it out. And so John is going to send out at least seven copies of his uh, apocalypse and maybe even more. So from the very beginning, we see that copying, collecting, and passing on which is the canon of Scripture. This is how the canon of Scripture came about. The early church copied, collected, passed it on. Copied, collected, passed it on. And so we see this in the early church. Even Peter, 
wrote in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, he said to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithia. Even Peter would have copied, sent them out. Those churches would have collected, copied, passed it on. That's how the canon of Scripture started, and the early church always knew which books were canonical. And so let me briefly say this, that they knew they had a canon. They had always collected the apostolic writings. All the four Gospels were there from day one. All of Paul's letters, all the Catholic letters were simply his universal epistles. They were all there. So why did the church ever need to officially put together a canon? This is what happened. There were three things that happened in church history that caused the church, even though they had the Scripture, even though it wasn't official, but they had it. And so what people say when they uh, lay accusations at the church, they say this. They say, well, you guys didn't figure out which books were canon until 397 A.D. That's absolutely not true. These books were in the canon of Scripture from day one, and there were some pressures that caused the church to have to officially say, these are our books. These are the three historical reasons why the canon of Scripture was developed. Number one, it was ecclesiastical. Number two, it was theological. Number three, it was political. The ecclesiastical issue was simply this. There had to be the public reading of Scripture. And so as the church grew and expanded geographically, they needed to know which books should be read out loud in church. No other books were allowed to be read out loud in church. It was only the Scripture. And so as the, as the church began to grow and as the churches began to, uh, to uh, raise up in the geographical areas that were outside the apostles' influence, they needed to know which books were actually a part of the canon of Scripture. Secondly, because of the evangelistic endeavors of the church, the church needed to know which books to translate into the languages of converted people. So that is the ecclesiastical reason. Secondly, we have the theological reason. The generation that followed the apostles is known as the early church apologists. After the early church apologists, the ministry of the theologian began. And since all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching or profitable for doctrine, there arose the need for an official accounting of those documents that con could contribute to the church's doctrinal beliefs. Along with that, there was another stimulus which simply had to do with heresy. There was heresy in the early church. And the most famous heretic was a guy by the name of Marcion in 140 A.D., The church, because of the heretics, had to begin to say, these are the books that are a part of the canon of Scripture, and these heretics out there that are either trying to write other books or trying to mess up the canon of Scripture like Marcion did, he actually tried to edit out all of the references to the Old Testament God in the Gospel of Luke, and he liked Paul, so all he had was Luke and Paul, and he tried to edit out all of the... Uh, uh, the references to the Old Testament God. He, he was a Gnostic. And so because he tried to limit the canon, he tried to take away from it, the church said, well, we need to, to put, put together an official list. And then there was the political reason. As the church began to grow and as the uh, Roman Empire began to try to squelch the growth of the early church, we find something called the Diocletian persecutions that started up in 302 to 305 A.D. Diocletian, we're told by the church historian Eusebius, ordered the destructions by fire of the Scriptures. And so as this persecution ensued, we find that Christians didn't want to stand up for a false gospel. You know, they come banging on your door and say, uh, give us all of your books. And if you got the Gospel of Thomas sitting right there, and you don't want to die for the Gospel of Thomas. You want to know which books are authoritative, what books to stake your life on, what book to live and die for. And also there were these forged documents that went out that needed to be dealt with in the 2nd and 3rd century. So how did the church determine their canon? And I'm running down real close here. 
I set myself at 50 minutes. I know I've got 56 minutes on the camera, so I'm going to try to get this done real quick. This is how they determined which would be included in the canon of Scripture, scripture officially. Number one, the book had to be inspired by God, which means authoritative. It had to be authoritative. It needed to show signs that God inspired the writer. Secondly, it had to be shown as prophetic, which means it had to be written by or approved by an apostle or a prophet. Thirdly, it had to be authentic. It actually had to be written within the generation of the eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. So it had to be authoritative, prophetic, and it had to be authentic. And the early church knew that the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Mary, the, uh, the Gospel of Nicodemus, the Apocalypse of Peter, they knew that all of these books were written after the Apostle John died. Apostle John died about 110 A.D. And so after the last Apostle died, man, the canon of Scripture is done. It also had to be dynamic. It had to be life-changing, life-transforming. And also it had to adhere to what is called the regule fide, which simply means the rule of faith, the rule of faith. It's the content of the preaching of the apostles. All through the book of Acts, we can extract the doctrine of the apostles. We know that Jesus died, rose again on the third day. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And as long as those documents adhered to the regule fide, that meant that they were authoritative and that they were Scripture. The fact that they didn't adhere to the, to the rule of faith, if you've ever read the Gospel of Thomas, let me tell you, it, it's, it's uh, interesting to say the least. There's one statement in there that says this, you women, if you want to be saved, you need to become men. It, it's a second century forgery. There's a lot of uh, goofiness in these Gnostic Gospels. The regular fide was simply uh, that which was always, everywhere, and by all received by the church, which leads us to our last category, which means it needed to be received by the church. The church had to receive it. The church had to recognize it as Scripture. The church had to read it publicly. And as I said, my first book is coming out, and, and I would never think that it was Scripture. So it would never be read in the church. But there were good books written during that time. There's actually one story that is, that is said as in the result of the Shepherd of Hermes. And uh, this is actually the Miratorian canon. And they said the Shepherd of Hermes is a good book, but it's not to be read out loud and in public. Read it in private because it's a good book. Now, we want to close up here. Let me give you the next points and inspiration, inerrancy, infallibility, canon, archaeology, manuscripts, predictive prophecy. So thank you for the opportunity of being here with you this evening, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Garth. We'll be available to answer your questions at the very, very end.